So good evening everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Do give me a one in the chat to let me know that I'm streaming and that my audio is coming through. So thanks all for being here. I do see Sergeant Grinch. And uh, yeah, today we continue with our discussion of Saint Pope Saint Pius X and of course the threat of modernism. And White Rose, great to hear, thank you. Yeah. So Many of the talks I've given recently discuss philosophy. I'm trying to distill and make sense of what is typically very complex ideas in philosophy, very complex ideas in classical history. We're talking about the Greek philosophers. And I think once you start to unpack these philosophies and simplify, what you discover is that these are incoherent philosophies by incoherent philosophers. These are simply people that are being obstinate, that are denying reality. And these philosophies have enabled the denial of reality. And this is really something that Pope Pius X, the X was warning about. One of, the, one of the underlying philosophies that causes the problems we see, that allows woke to flourish, that allows transanity to flourish, is nominalism. And here's where we need to discuss William of Ockham, and that's where I ended last week, and I'll continue from there. Welcome, Tom. Uh, good to see you, Tom Kiyokai. All right, let's jump into this. So I will... All right, this is where we ended last week. I'll just briefly pick up again. So William of Ockham is the guy that said that uh, Ockham's razor, right, that what most people simply claim is that we shouldn't multiply our entities unnecessarily. Don't make things more complex than you have to, essentially. However, the context in which he said it, as I discussed last week, was that this actually was not used in a scientific sense. It was not used in a mathematical sense. He used it really within a theological sense to simplify theology. And by simplifying theology, he was sweeping common logical, well, common theological ideas under the rug, to get rid of them, to implement a new set of theological ideas, in other words, to corrupt Christianity, in short. So I think this is something that, from what the way I'm reading it, this is something he is guilty of. Let me go to this very last paragraph of his in orange. Welcome, Dr. Jonathan Gemmel, good to see you. Let me read this passage, and let's try to work out just what the heck he's saying here. He writes here now, the argument here is, of course, that he is a nominalist. This is the very toxic, extremely corrosive ideology that I discussed last week in this uh, discussion. And I went into some depth yesterday on part one of my talk on nominalism, which I will continue during the week. Now, he says here, in order to demonstrate the statement of faith that we formulate about God, what we would need for the central concept is a simple cognition of the divine nature in itself. Cognition, recognition, and understanding. What, so, what someone who sees God has. Nevertheless, we cannot have this kind of cognition in our present state. So what is he saying here? Well, very simple. Occam is saying that in order to prove or explain our beliefs about God, it is necessary to have a direct understanding or knowledge of the nature of the divine itself. However, he also states that in our current state, as we are as human beings on earth, it is impossible for us to have this kind of understanding. We cannot have divine knowledge. Now, this was the same argument that the nominalists are making. All you have, of, all you have is knowledge of what happens inside your skin, an entirely subjective set of sense impressions that you are getting. So all you know is what is inside your skin. The outside is not real or you are unable to grasp anything from the outside world. There is no objective world even for you to grasp any knowledge of, right? So therefore, all you have is the myth that you make up inside your head. That's effectively what he is saying. This, of course, is not the Christian position. This is not the Catholic position, but this is the Lutheran and Calvinist position. So Luther and Calvin's doctrine of depravity is commonly referred to as total depravity or total inability. So this doctrine asserts that due to the sinful nature inherited from Adam, humanity is entirely corrupted and incapable of achieving salvation or righteousness on its own. It emphasizes the need for divine grace and intervention 
for salvation. Hopefully you can see there is a certain overlap, certain parallel with these two ideas. So this, these ideas come a couple of hundred years later, but these are much related. Martin Luther very much learned from Sir William of Ockham and took on this idea of nominalism. Of course, very welcome. Uh, I would tell you to do five push-ups, but yeah, uh, I, I, you know, I have to give you an exception there. All right. So, but welcome horse. Okay. Let's, let's cancel. Now this gets a little complex. This gets a little technical over the next couple of slides, but, um, and I will bring something to simplify that because even I don't perfectly understand this, but let's talk first about Occam. He calls the, the Trinity, a logical contradiction. So the Trinity is the core doctrine according to which, right? This is the core Christian doctrine, all right? <laughs> according to which God is three persons in one, right? So Christians say that the Trinity is a mystery. We don't really understand it. This is something that is outside of our imperfect human understanding. This is not something that is entirely grasped by logic, right? This is a theological mystery. So meaning it is beyond comprehension of the human mind. So Occam goes so far as to admit that it is a blatant contradiction. So he is now applying human logic. It's like scientists saying, well, I checked in my telescope and I looked in my microscope and I checked in my, my ohm meter and I couldn't find God. It's like, yes, those tools are not designed to find those kinds of quantities or those kinds of entities. See, so he's using logic. God is beyond that. This is not to say God is illogical, but of course, God is beyond logic. This doesn't mean God isn't rational or coherent, but God is not something you can quantify. Just like a woman, you can't simply quantify down to um, someone who wears a bra and then I put on a bra and now I'm a woman, right? So just God is not simply something you can simply simplify down to just one single element and say, well, I checked in my, you know, I checked in my microscope didn't see it right so he says no that this is a contradiction the trinity is a contradiction it is irrational so he explains the problem as follows thank you john x very welcome dan simpson good morning so according to the doctrine of the trinity god is the father and jesus is god welcome dragon good to see you therefore by transitivity where we carry the sense of something over according to the doctrine of the trinity jesus is the father right? So God is the father. Jesus is God. Therefore, Jesus is the father. Yet according to the doctrine of the Trinity, Jesus is not the father. So now understand he's reducing the concept of the Trinity to human semantics, to human, well, logic. And of course, he's here using absurd logic. So he's saying, well, we've got this imperfect understanding. We've got logic. And according to the words, right? We don't capture God, so therefore God does not exist, or something like that. So now, do you understand the theological door that he opens, the theological floor that he has now made, and how this then starts to undermine and start to tear down our concept of theology? <clears throat> so according to the doctrine of the Trinity, Jesus both is and is not the Father. So this is the same kind of semantic games that atheists play. It's the same kind of semantic games that Muslims play. Right? Does this make sense so far? Right. So many medieval philosophers suggested that the transitive in inference to the conclusion is broken by different senses of the word is. So now it comes down to the word is. It comes down to the meaning of what is means. So now this becomes a semantic game where who can make the cleverest statement as opposed to a genuine, shall we say, humility in front of the divine and by saying, look, we don't understand this. We don't quite understand it. We have logic, but logic is not really designed to answer these kinds of questions. Here is where we need to go. Look, here's a matter of faith. This cannot be captured by logic. So love all these hypocrites who have never seen a quark directly yet believe in them because, because of physicist experiments, yet they willfully exactly horse. Exactly. Yes. There you go. So yeah. Now, John Dunce Scotus argued that the logic of the Trinity does not obey normal logic. This is a mystery of faith transcending human reason. This is where we say, look, our tools are not good enough to understand this problem, or at least not good enough to understand this problem yet. So for Occam, this example established that theology is not logical. 
No, it means that he was able to create a logical absurdity using words and grammar. This does not necessarily mean that God is illogical. It means that, or that our idea is illogical. It means that he couldn't describe it, or he was able to build something illogical out of words. The fact that it is possible to build something illogical out of words, to make illogical constructs out of grammar, doesn't mean that, that this thing is necessarily illogical. It just means that you described it in a manner that is illogical. Right? So he says, no, this example establishes that theology is not logical and must be kept separate from philosophy. So theology is not logical. Biological is not logical, right? Because men can be women. Theology, theological, is not logical. We cannot apply logic to theology. Therefore, we can make things up as we go. We can invent it as we like. Do you, do you see where this leads with this thinking automatically leads the door that it opens, right? It blows a hole a mile wide into Christian doctrine and allows anything and everything in. Does that make sense to you as an audience? So welcome all of you who are here. I see the audience count is growing very quickly, right? And so, yeah, this opens the door to Martin Luther. Now let's continue. Occam's four causes in terms of four questions. So now Occam has this philosophy. Dr. Jonathan Gemmel, great stuff. Thank you. Yeah, uh, the fact that I have um, PhDs and <laughs> this is actually watching the channel, and and you know people with far more university education than I do, who um, who say who affirm what I'm saying, that that's really nice to know. Okay, so Occam's four causes in terms of four questions. So, right, he says there is no evidence of purpose in the natural world. Who else says that? Well, atheists, right? We've got. Sham Harris, right? You've got Richard Dawkins saying there is no purpose in the natural world. That's an atheist position. This is supposed to be a great Franciscan monk, a great Catholic, an intellectual giant who's an intellectual midget who undermined and blew a hole under Christianity, who blew a hole in the foundations of Christian belief. So now living before Christianity, Aristotle did not know the Trinity, right? He did not have access to divine revelation, Right, as we have, as the Jews did with the Bible, and then subsequently Christians. Right, so he does not. He does seem to believe in a supernatural force. Right, that's what Aristotle believed in a supernatural force that lends purpose to nature. So we see all of this in his doctrine of the four causes, according to which every existing thing requires a fourfold explanation. Sham Harris, yes, you heard Sham Harris, Sham Harris, the Sham, yeah, Harris. So, Paulus, welcome. I'm always late. Yeah, yeah, five push-ups, man. That's the least you can do. Five push-ups, you're late. Yeah, and thanks for tough covering the topic of modernism. Yeah, I've been doing so, actually, since I started speaking in other talks. I've done it now in my um, scientific paganism and other talks prior to that. I've, I've been moving in this direction for some months, and I will be covering this for a handful of months still, because I'll be going into Martin Luther probably within the next three weeks or so. We'll start discussing Martin Luther. We, we have to, and that's going to take a long time. There's a lot of material on that, man. I've been working on Martin Luther now for three years. I've been promising I'm going to be talking about Martin Luther for about three years now. And um, it's just taken a lot longer to unpack this man's idiocy, foolishness, his blasphemy. And there's more that I don't know, but um, but yeah, let's, let's, let's begin. You know, someone has to put the record straight. So let's talk about, let's talk about Aristotle. So the first cause, right? Aristotle's first cause. And I should have put this into my talk last night. I didn't explain it so well um, last night. I, I keep forgetting. I've got different strands, parallel strands of work I'm working on, research I'm working on, and I don't always carry my, my notes over from one to another because the contexts are different and I forget. Um, Lloyd, I've just joined the Jesus talking to the Samaritan womanists. They are new Protestant church. So far, everything is going well. <laughs> Good stuff. We'll, we'll be talking about that someday soon. Yeah, ten push-ups for forget. <laughs> you know, um, you know, I d d ten push-ups, huh? Okay, okay, fine. I'll do uh, five today, five tomorrow. Okay. So welcome, Barrington. Okay. So the first cause: what is something made of? The second cause: what does it do? The third cause: what brought it about? Fourth cause, why does it do what it does, right? Those are Aristotle's questions, which give us an indication of something's form, something's purpose. Now, medieval philosophers found Aristotle's 
four causes compatible with the Christian worldview. Right? The four causes, or so the fourth cause aligned with the doctrine of divine providence, which is part of God's plan. Right? Now, reluctant to disagree with Aristotle, now don't forget, Martin Luther simply turned this up to 11. He just hated Aristotle. He called Aristotle effectively satanic. Right? Aristotle was Satan to him. So Occam was determined to keep theology separate from science and philosophy. So he wanted to build a divide, build a wall between logic and theology, which means that you've unmoored theology from reason. Therefore, you can now introduce irrationality, illogical ideas, myth, fantasy, feelings. So he felt, <clears throat> okay, so he criticized the fourth cause, small typo there, right? So which he calls final cause, right? Occam writes, if I accepted no authority, I would claim that it cannot be proved either from statements known in themselves or from experience that every effect has a final cause. Someone who is just following natural reason would claim the, that the question why is inappropriate in the case of natural actions. For he would maintain that it is no real question to ask something like, for what reason is fire generated? Right? That's in Quad Libetal Questions, pages 246 to 249. So, someone other than me can analyze that and look at why that is illogical, right? But you're talking about an impersonal force. I think we know why fire is generated. This doesn't mean that God caused fire, but that it is possible to make fire. But when you're speaking of people, why are we generated? Why are we created? What are we meant to do? Well, we're meant to do good, right? We're made in the image of God. We're meant to act in the image of God. Here, he is creating a false question, false dichotomy, right? He's focusing in the wrong, in the wrong direction. Again, it's semantics. It's not logical. So Occam writes his criticism in hypothetical third-person terms because he knew that openly asserting that the universe is entirely purposeless would provoke backlash. He knew that if he challenges rea well, reality, rationality, as we understand it, right? if he utterly went against the traditions of the West in this fashion, this would invite backlash. So therefore, he was very careful to phrase things as he did to create these sophist forms of questions. Right? <clears throat> so... Let's have a quick analysis of Occam's argument on the Trinity. So to analyze Occam's arguments that the Trinity is a logical contradiction, we first need to lay out the premises and the conclusions, right? Put forward in the syllogism, right? Premise one, God is the Father. Premise two, Jesus is God. Therefore, three, right? Jesus, conclusion one, Jesus is the Father. This is by transitivity based on P1 and P2. This idea, God is the Father, Jesus is God, right? This carries across. Therefore, Jesus is the Father by transitivity based on P1, premise 1, and premise 2. So, the contradiction arises from Christian doctrine. Premise 3, Jesus is not the Father, right? If God is the Father and Jesus is God, therefore, Jesus is the Father, but Jesus is not the Father. So, his argument concludes that Jesus both is and is not the Father, leading to five. Conclusion two, the Trinity is a logical contradiction. So, applying propositional logic, right, and assuming the identity relation is transitive and reflexive, if God, the Father, and Jesus refer to identical entities without a qualifier or a context, then this is a contradiction, right? Because conclusion one and premise three cannot be true. Now, what we also realize is what he's forgetting here, what he's deliberately, yeah, Occam's razor is not as sharp as it should be. Correct. Here he's playing a semantic game. He's playing a sophist game. Because also we do understand that they're one in essence, they're different in person. Right? These are three distinct persons with the same essence. Now, again, this is something that we claim we don't have full logical understanding of. Because we're saying this is beyond the limits of our logic. This doesn't mean it's irrational. It just means we don't have a way to calculate it. Right? So the contradiction violates the law of non-contradiction, which states that contradictory statements cannot both be true in the same sense and in the same time. So now he's trying to basically claim that God, the creator of the universe, falls within this narrow view of logic. So, however, the apparent contradiction hinges on the interpretation of the word 
is. So what I want to illustrate here is how this becomes very quickly absurd, right? How this becomes a matter of semantics, how it becomes a matter of word games. And pretty soon you are arguing over the dumbest things looking in the wrong direction. So I want to show you how this thing just tumbles downhill and just goes, just goes weird. So the contradiction now hinges on the interpretation of the word is. God is the Father. Jesus is God. Therefore, Jesus is the Father. Well, it depends on how you mean is. In what sense is this, right? So the concept, so it depends on the interpretation of the word is and the concepts of identity, oops, right, involved in the theological doctrine of the Trinity. So now this thing just goes nuts, right? So the response by other theologians, such as John Duns Scotus, is that the traditional logic does not apply in the same way because there are different senses of is in use when referring to the divine persons and the unity of God, right? But now you're playing within the rules of logic and God would thus be beyond logic. Uh, so let me see questions and comments coming in. So let me see. Um, yeah, Occam was a sophist. Exactly. He created this mess, right? So the issue is that the claim that the Father and God are the same category or type. Exactly. Right? But we're discussing the different category. Same essence, different, same substance, different person. Right? So another education video is more important than learning about LGBT barbecue. <laughs> yes. School is getting more garbage correct. Yeah, it's it's going nuts out there. Bill Clinton infamously stated under oath, it depends on what the definition of is is. Exactly. As did Bill Gates during the Windows trial back in the 90s. Uh, welcome, welcome. I just got home from Mass. Yeah, I know it's different. Uh, I, I give you an exception, <laughs> Dr. Obvious. Okay. So now I don't claim to understand this very well. I have tried to simplify it, but even I don't necessarily understand it. I've got something else I've written, which simplifies this kind of, but again, as I mentioned yesterday in my talk on nominalism, there's a reason why this language is so complex, because if you, once you break it down and understand it, you realize these people are actually stupid. Right. You realize these ideas are incoherent and, and illogical. Therefore, it's got to be written in such a way as to make it so obscure and so difficult to understand that unless you have a PhD, you can't, you can't understand this. Right. But once you read it, once you actually simplify it, it's nuts. You're like, this is stupid. Okay, so as per the Christian understanding of the Trinity, is does not signify strict identity, but it means a unity right, within a complex doctrine. So a complex unity that posits one God in three distinct persons. So the persons of the Trinity are distinct, yet of the same substance. They're not separate beings. This is something beyond our ability to comprehend, right? So the underlying claim is that our concepts of personhood and substance when applied to the infinite nature of God exceeds the limits of human understanding and the strictures of standard propositional logic. What I showed you with P1 and C1, the conclusions and the premises that that's propositional logic, right? That's looking at the meanings of words, but for that you have to have very clear meanings of words. Your grammar has to be very precise. Welcome, Eric. Welcome, Ernesto. Therefore, the logical rules governing identity and transitivity, which work with finite concepts, right, may not apply directly to doctrines about the nature of God, which are often considered to be different, right? Don't ask me what univocal and equivocal means. I'm just putting the words out there because, man, I didn't bother him to look them up. Okay, so... So Occam might argue from a logical perspective that demands clarity and distinction without equivocation that the Trinity cannot be understood in terms of logical coherency. And of course, we've always said that this is a mystery. It does stand outside of our knowledge of logic, right? So, and so it doesn't fit the logic as we apply it to other entities, right? So this may lead him to conclude that the theological assertions should be compartmentalized because this logic isn't complete, because it cannot analyze everything in nature. Therefore, we need to separate it and stick it in its own compartment and minimalize it, right? So therefore, we need to throw it out, basically, and then separate science from theology and scientific thinking from theology. Do you understand? But this gives him a way to separate theology out from reason, and thus he can now manipulate theology the way that he likes, because it's no longer bound by reason. Because reason and faith, faith and theology and reason they work together. These two things work together and the one constrains the other. The one doesn't let reason become completely stultified and completely, what's the word, material. And also reason doesn't let theology become completely mythical and go off into realms of fantasy. Dr. Obvious, I'm a retired neurosurgeon, a pharmacist and basset hound service human. 
See, three distinct identifications all in one. Brilliant. Yeah, brilliantly said. Why is it so hard for sophists to comprehend? Thank you for putting it so simply and plainly. Lloyd, am I going against the science? Um, you know, the science is settled. Uh, the science is settled until, yeah, I guess, look, we're going to have to go against the science here because, because man, I, I don't think men can be women. I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm way too primitive. I'm from Africa. I'm way too primitive to believe any stories about men be, becoming women. Lloyd, we've got to reject our conscious mind because it's delusional. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, hopefully I'm making sense. I'm not saying that I understand every aspect that I've pointed out here, every word that I've written here, every one of these arguments that I lifted from Princeton and Cambridge and Oxford and other places, and from scholars that, that, that write in ways that just confuse the heck out of me. But hopefully you understand that this just becomes a bunch of logical fallacies, a bunch of sophistry, a bunch of words, word games. Did you understand how this just goes off the rails? Okay, so... He wants to compartmentalize this, and so he wants to argue for what he calls non-overlapping magisterium between theology and philosophy. So you've got the priests on this side, they've got their domain, and you've got the scientists over here, they've got their domain, and the two don't talk, the two don't mix. And th philosophically, right, so th theoretically, scientists don't comment on theology because that theology stuff is not logical, and the theology doesn't comment on science because they've got nothing to say about science because they're not rational and that we science guys are doing rational stuff and theology is stupid Do you understand but the, this doesn't stop the scientists from insulting denigrating maligning theology see they simply made it disempowered they simply took the wind out of the sails okay so it's just semantics that's what it comes down to but this was an attack this was an attack a very well phrased very sly, very subtle, but it is an attack on reason, it's an attack on society, it's an attack on theology, it's an attack on the church. Very simple. It just undermines the Bible, it undermines the biblical message, it undermines morality. Because this whole idea of nominalism, ultimately, even though it's it's what you would call, it's a, it's a theory, right? It's an idea, it's a philosophy, it's an error. It's really just an error. But it has theological implications, it has scientific implications, it has legal implications, it has broad, deep social implications. So, in the analysis, right, if we disregard this nuanced theological interpretation and insist on, actually, let me just skip that line. I'm going to skip this. I'm just going to go to the last, I'm going to go to the last paragraph and read something else. So, so this doesn't mean that this doctrine is necessarily logically coherent by philosophical standards, right? Because even though a doctrine can be incoherent, it can be consistent in and of itself. So it can be internally consistent. It can be total garbage, but it can be internally consistent. Right. So and also you may not be apply be able to apply standard logical analysis to something because it's irrational, but it has its own internal weird twisted logic, an upside down logic. Let's have a quick look at this. Right. Let's let's rephrase this. Let's look at it in a different way. So Christians believe in the Trinity, which is like this is this is my effort to simplify this whole argument, <clears throat> to take all of this mumbo jumbo that I saw in these, like I said, from Princeton and Harvard and all these other weird places. This is my effort to simplify this. Right. Christians believe in the Trinity. This is an idea that God is made up of three different parts. Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Here's the tricky part. Even though there are three separate parts, they're considered one God, not three different gods. Right? Now, don't forget, when we look at what Occam ultimately implies here, he implies there are three separate gods. Right? You can't have three that's one. There have to be three separate entities. So now you're opening yourself up to tritheism. That's a heresy. Right? Or tritheism. So when people try to use regular logic to understand the Trinity, they run into a problem. Logic says that if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A should be equal to C. But with the Trinity, you're told that while Jesus is God, and God is the Father, Jesus is not the Father. That C is not equal to A, even though A is equal to B and B is equal to C, but C is not equal to A. That's like saying A is B, B is C, but A is not C, which doesn't make sense in logic, right? So Occam argued that if you try to apply normal logic to the Trinity, it doesn't make sense. It's like trying to solve a puzzle where the pieces don't fit according to the usual rules. So he said, look, we should keep religious beliefs and logical reasoning separate to avoid confusion. Very smart move, very sly. It's an error. But yes, where did he get these ideas? See, wh where did they get these, these forms of argument? The Muslims were doing this. So here I have to ask, like, like, what is the infiltration of Islam into this? 
right? What is the infiltration of Islam into this? I'm not saying that I can readily prove it, but when you look at the way Muslims think, when you look at the way Dawah works, and when you start to think about how these, how Luther was writing, and especially Calvin, you start to think, man, you just see these Muslim fingerprints. You just see the language, the Dawah, just these fingerprints on it. And it's like, ah, it's like, yeah, it's definitely there. Okay. So on the other hand, the idea of the Trinity is not meant to be taken with the same logic we use for everyday things, right? The word is in Jesus is God is not meant to show an equation like in math. Understand? So now he's, he's making what's called a category error. He's applying one sense of something to another, but this is not meant to be taken that way, right? It's a special kind of unity or connection that's not easy to understand or explain with normal logic. So we're not using logic. We need to understand it in terms of grammar. We're trying to be precise in language. This is a grammar problem, not a logic problem. This is theological, not scientific, not mathematical, right? So thus, if we take the religious view that these connections in the Trinity are unique, then it's not about being logically contradictory. It's just a mystery of faith. So using Occam's thinking, if you want logic to work like normal, the Trinity seems like a contradiction, a square circle. But, here, but if you accept the religious explanations that normal logic doesn't apply, then the Trinity is not about being logical, but about believing, even though it's hard to explain. Okay, I hope that made sense. That is included in the um, in the text of this document. I tried to simplify what is being said here, but I, I wanted to present some of this because, man, it, it, when I try and read this and I try and understand this, it gives me a headache, right? And hopefully it gave you one too, because you can understand the kind of the kind of knots that can cause this can cause in your head, right? And the kind of logical arguments and theological arguments and debates and the nonsense and the back and forth here, right? But you're arguing about a category error. You should just regard it as an error and then move on. But yeah. All right. So now, divine command theory. Okay, so Connor, yeah. Water, steam, and ice are all one essence, but in three forms. That is true. However, this can also lead to another heresy. Right? I can't remember the name offhand, but this does lead to another heresy because people say, well, sometimes you have the Holy Spirit and that's steam, and then you have water, that's Jesus, and you have ice, and that's God. Right. This also, people have misused this analogy in terms of implying that at different times you have different aspects, except that that would be one God appearing in three different forms. Right. So it's the same character, the same person appearing in three different ways, just shape changing, if you will. Right. Whereas you've got three separate people. So you'd have to have ice. That's modalism. Yes, that's it. Thank you, Yeshua. Yeah. Modalism. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, modalism, Paulus. Yes, thank you. So whereas you've got all three simultaneously, it's, it's, it's not a bad analogy, but it's also not a good analogy. It's kind of, yeah, it's a really hard concept to explain. This is why we struggle with this. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, that is, yeah, exactly. A very good point. It's just, it's just your boy, Jay. Yeah. Isn't like three types of visions of yourself in a dream. You can also be conscious and say that you're in a dream second person and so forth. Yeah, that's a fair point. Okay, now let's look at divine command theory. So I'm using here Oxford. I went to, went to Oxford University. And now we're going to talk about Islam and Calvin a little bit. Mr. Calvin and Islam. So, okay. He was summoned to the papal court in Avignon before he was able to finish his degree at Oxford. Right, so Occam was told to come to the papal court in Avignon before being able to finish his degree at Oxford. The top is chopped off. What do you mean the top is chopped off? No, let me just double check my own stream. Let me have a look here. Nope, it's looking normal. It's looking perfectly normal. Nope, it's looking like it should. Um, I'm checking the stream and it's looking... No, it's looking perfectly normal. No, I, I'm checking the stream. I monitor the stream as well. Looks fine here. Um, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so let's continue. Right. His dispute with church authority began with metaphysics. It soon became political. So after four years of house arrest, he escaped, and he claimed that Pope John XII was a heretic. However, he never renounced Catholicism. Okay, so this is this is odd. Yeah, pinch out. You might have zoomed in too much. It's possible, Yahweh, Yeshua is Yahweh, that you are zoomed in too much. 
So he never renounced Catholicism. He never said, well, I, I detest the church, right? So the church says, well, he died in the arms of the church as a good Catholic. Now, that's a nice story, but maybe not, because once you start reading through his works and what he said, you're like, this is not Christian. This is not Catholic, and this is not even Christian. Whatever this guy is, he sounds more like a modern atheist. He sounds like Sam Harris or Richard Dawkins. So from exile in Munich, Germany, he writes political treatises that provide a groundbreaking defense of human rights. Now they say, well, you know, he was a great man. Look at the wonderful things he wrote. Separation of church and state. Now notice separation of church and state. When you look at the original Catholic interpretation of this, the, there was no separation of church and state, nor is there in the American Constitution a separation of church and state. That was not understood that way. Now it is, but that's a reinterpretation. That is, that is literally turning upside down the old view that the church had responsibility in terms of making sure the state remained moral, that, that the politics never got so disassociated from religious values. So, right, and also freedom of speech. Well, he's protecting freedom of speech because he wants to lie and talk absolute poop. So he would be writing things like, well, let me use my free speech to undermine you and destroy your society, right? John the 12th, not John the 22nd. You're right. You're right. It's John the 12th, not John the 22nd typo. But as you guys know, I provide I provide free typos in every presentation. I provide multiple. I leave these as Easter eggs for you guys to find as an exercise. All right. So, yeah, I do appreciate that. Let me go and uh, fix this non-typo. I'm definitely going to fix this. Was non -type this is a non-typo and it was meant to be there. I'm going to, there we go. Typos are my favorite. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, so you have freedom of speech, yeah, but when you say something they don't like, like you say men are women, then it's like, oh, you can go to jail for that. Free typos are the best. <laughs> yeah, so. Okay, so he's in Excel and he writes all these supposedly wonderful things, right? Because Easter eggs, yes, because they wanted to look at him as a genius, the great man of wisdom and man of intellect, a man of science, the modern man that we need to respect. It's like, no, 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 no. This is He's the last guy that you need to give any kind of respect. So he upholds the absolute omnipotence of God. But what kind of God? Because we just saw that he takes the Trinity apart and he goes like, this Trinity stuff is not logical. So what version of God is he talking about? So this commits him to what he calls divine command theory, also known as occasionalism in ethics, right? God can command individuals to do things that may ordinarily be wrong, such as you can disobey the Pope. That's the context of his day. But, because, so, or God can say, you know what? You need to eat babies. You need to eat live babies. You need to torture babies. You need to torture puppies. What you need to do is you need to marry a five-year-old. You need to marry five-year-old girls and make them your wife and do the things that men do with wives. You need to do that. But because God commanded this, because it is God making the command, what that means is that it is good because God said so. And anything God says is good. So Yeshua is Yahweh says, occasionalism, isn't that Hanafi theology? That's just a little bit Muslim. Exactly. That's why I've got up here Calvin and I've got the Islamic symbol. Where do you understand the implications of this? Now that he's brought in nominalism, now that he's undermined and destroyed the Trinity, now suddenly he opens the door to this theology. Do you understand where this leads? Do you understand the problems that this has now caused? Because God said, Okay, God can say. So he's saying, look, we need to rethink ethics. We need to rethink morality. Because you see, as William of Ockham, me being so smart and just, I'm William here. You got to listen to me. Um, you know, I'm a genius. I'm, I'm an incredible man. See, if God had to say, um, Muhammad, go and shag a five-year-old, right? It's not immoral. It is not wrong because God said to do it. Therefore, it's right. You know, Muhammad, go and murder lots of people and steal their stuff. Kill for Allah. Then it's it's not, murder is no longer bad because God said it. And whatever you do for God, because God commands it, God makes the immoral moral because it's right, because you're doing it for God, because God said so. Do you understand the problem? Please drop me a one in the chat if you understand this problem. This was introduced. Now, don't forget, this stuff made its way into 
This idea makes its way right into Protestantism. Martin Luther laps this stuff up like it's freaking ice cream, okay? Calvin jumps on this and starts chugging liters of this stuff. Do you understand the problem? This is not Christian. This is satanic. This is, this is, this is anything but Christian. Of course, they know it's wrong, so they've got to hide it. They've got to, they've got to, they've got to hide it under a layer. They've got to put lipstick on this pig, right? So, <clears throat> Momo couldn't help it. Help it. He self-identified as a child rapist. Yes. Thanks, everyone. I'm glad you understand. I'm glad it makes the point. Thank you, Dragon. Always good to have you. Thank you. Thank you for your support. So, universal flamethrower. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Right, so God can command things that would we would normally that against that our internal sense, our internal morality would consider wrong. But it's okay. This is why Muslims will defend Muhammad. They will defend anything he did because it was him following the divine command. This is Islamic theology. This is Islamic error. This is the kind of nonsense, the kind of evil, and this crept into the church. Do you understand the depth of this problem? So in the Euthyphro dialogue. Plato, who lived from 437 to 347 BC, poses a question. Is something good because God wills it? So is it good that we don't murder, that we don't steal, that we don't lie because God says so? Or does God will something because that thing is good? Right? This is an interesting question. Atheists occasionally like to pose this question. Euthyphro's dilemma, it is called. The Euthyphro dilemma. So is something inherently good because God wills? says so, you must do this, therefore it is good, right? It is good because God commanded it, and therefore we say, okay, well, whatever God says is good. Or does God will something because it is good? Does God recognize that this thing is moral, this thing is good, therefore we humans should do it, right? But notice there's an abstraction, a separation between the thing and God, right? Whereas Christians, we have a completely different view of this. God is the substrate of life. He is being. God is good. Good flows from God. God doesn't recognize good things in the world. God is the basis of good. So most philosophers affirm the latter, right? That God wills things because they are good. God thought about it, asked it, phoned a friend, checked in the dictionary, checked on the internet and said, yeah, that, that's good. We shouldn't steal. And says, okay, everyone, my followers, don't steal, guys. Don't steal because I checked this. I did some sums, checked in the microscope, looked on the internet. Google said it's good. It's a good idea. I, I took a vote. And uh, that's what most philosophers affirm. But divine command theorists affirm the former. Anything that God says you can do, and remember, this is not the Christian God. Anything that whatever your deity says is good is therefore good because your deity said it. So sodomy is good because God allows it. Yeah, well, exactly, exactly. See? So Occam's divine theory can be seen as a consequence of his metaphysical libertarianism, right? Absolute sovereignty minus natural law. So what you've got is you've got the Calvinist idea of absolute sovereignty of God minus natural law. They're denying natural law because they're denying, in effect, the nature of God. Do you understand? This is what Occam introduced. So truth took flesh, goodness took flesh, love took flesh. Good points. Okay, now let's continue. So what we conclude from this is, hello, Islam. So yes, so that was a very good catch. Yeshua is Yahweh. Yeah, I promise I didn't type this in as I was talking here. I actually knew it was Islamic, but it was a very good catch that you saw it so early on. Very good catch. And two, hello, John Calvin. Of course, hello, Martin Luther too, right? Calvin just made it more obvious than Martin Luther did. But this stuff, unfortunately, the founders of the Protestant faith took up this idea. And I hope you can see there is a problem with this philosophy. There is something deeply immoral about this philosophy if Martin Luther and John Calvin with taking on Islamic ideas into their theology. I'd say that is blasphemous, that is heresy, and that is absolutely unforgivable and wrong. So, divine command theory, occasionalism. So, it's a metaphysical theory, of course, that posits that finite things have no efficient causality of their own, right? And whatever happens in the world is caused by God, right? With creatures serving as the occasions for divine activity. What does that mean? Hell, I don't know. That's why this language just drives me nuts. So God is the ultimate source of all actions and events in the world. So you don't actually do anything. God does them and you simply are like a puppet on a string, right? So God is the ultimate source of all actions and events in the world and creatures are passive recipients or instruments through which God's will is manifested. Did you go and stab someone? Well, it wasn't you. 
it was God that did it. And um, you're not responsible, you see, because you don't have free will. Do you see where we're leading with this? Um, so yeah, just confirm, drop a one if you guys, if this makes sense, if this, if this makes sense now, if you understand how backwards this is, but if it makes sense within and of itself, it's not coherent, try that in court, Owen Shelton, try that in court, exactly, exactly. So yeah, it makes a mockery of the law. It makes a mockery of morality. It makes a mockery of everything society is built on. It makes a mockery of logic. Do you understand? This This is nominalism. This is what flows from it. The kinds of errors and the kinds of craziness that stems from this. So thank you guys. Good to know because the, this was very complex for me to try to simplify and understand and then to try to carry across to you as an audience, right? So we are passive recipients of instruments through which God's will is manifested. Right? And of course, we're not guilty. If God made us do it, then we're not guilty. You see, that opens up some crazy theology. If God made us do it, we're not responsible. It was good because God wanted that person to die by the knife and or whatever the case is. So you killed them and by whatever, and therefore jihad is good because God said it. Do you understand? You can then justify literally anything. Evil becomes good. This is unfortunately the result of this occasionalism, this divine command theory. So this is rooted. So basically that was just God's will manifest. I'm an instrument of God. I'm not evil. Do you understand? This is evil pretending now to be good. So it is rooted in Greek philosophy and back to these pagan Greeks. And this was further developed in modern philosophy, particularly in response to the Cartesian mind-body problem. We'll talk about Descartes and Kant and all of these fools later on. Thank you, Dragon. Good to know. Yeah, Protestant believer says, Isaiah 5.20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Exactly. So here we've got here we've got this good Catholic, this very bad Catholic, okay, called a good Catholic, but this horrible, horrible philosopher, this evil man who now suddenly has opened this can of worms, right? The heresy of the denial of free will. Yes. So occasionalism was foreshadowed in the Stoic philosophy. That's the old Greek philosophy going back 25, 2600 years again, which viewed God as pervading nature and determining the actions of all being through the instinct of self-preservation. Oh, does that sound like evolution? Because when you look at the roots of evolution, you look at Darwinian evolution, that's a pagan idea. That's 100% a pagan idea filtered through an Islamic idea, which was originally. So what basically Darwin had was Greek paganism, added onto a layer or filtered through a layer of Sufi Muslim, what they called Muhammadan evolution. So you had Greek mythology, Greek paganism, Greek poetry, filtered through Sufi poetry, Muhammadan evolution. And boom, they, they stick on some sciencey sounding words and now you've got Darwinist evolution, right? So understand now you've got this instinct of self-preservation. Now also, this is why you have materialism. You've got this mechanical materialism. That's why you have Calvin with his theological determinism. Sorry, you've got materialist um, determinism, and then you've got theological determinism, which effectively end up in the same place. They start differently, but they end up exactly the same, that you have no choice. Your atoms made you do it, right? In this case, you are simply... So these. this is just a corruption of this original Greek idea, this pagan idea, which is complete garbage. So, <clears throat> also love the guy who did the free won't because the mind is not inherently the brain, even if their brain was sliced in half. Sliced in, sliced in half. Yeah, in fact, there is a guy in about 20 years ago, I think it's like 20 years ago, uh, there was a guy that, that had some kind of disease and his brain started producing far too much, um, there's a fluid in the brain, I cannot remember. It's a real case. Uh, there's a guy that there was fluid in the brain um, that that his brain started producing too much of this, and what happened was um, he started to because of the, the the amount of this fluid that he was producing, it actually acted like an acid, and it it rotted away. It ate away ninety percent of his brain matter, and at the end of the day, he had mostly just a hollow cavity, right, and only ten percent of his brain matter around his skull was left. So. He was left with 10% of his, uh, his brain, not the, what's the, the fluid, the fluid in the brain, um, there's a fluid, not that, but, but anyway, so what happens, he had 10% of his brain matter left, and yet he functioned cerebrospinal fluid, yes, that's the one, hydrocephaly, yeah, it's probably hydrocephaly, but cerebrospinal fluid, <laughs> thank you, yes, Michelle, so what happened was, he, he was overproducing this and the stuff acted like acid, it literally corroded his brain away, he had 10% of his brain matter left. Right, just a thin layer around his skull. 
And so what happened was he still functioned normally on 10% of the original brain matter. His brain was able to reorganize, retain his memories, retain his abilities, retain his functions. So he was effectively normal. According to what I've read, he was effectively normal despite having 10% of a normal human's brain matter. So this is more evidence than that the brain is beyond the matter. It's not produced by the matter. The brain is something well beyond just the material. But moving on. Okay. <clears throat> so let's continue. Let's continue here. So the full development of this occasionalism is found in the modern philosophy, right? Particularly in the works of Descartes and Johannes Clauburg, right? So Descartes attributed the power of directing bodily movements to the soul. Now, this doesn't make him a good guy, right? The guy talks a bunch of poop as well. So this conflicted with his denial of any immediate interaction between mind and body. So Clauberg, building on Descartes' ideas, proposed that all phenomena in the outside world are caused by God, and any apparent action of the mind upon the outside world is just illusion. If that makes sense, whatever. It's what it is. Let's move on. But according to Catholic teaching, right, God's wisdom governs the world. God imparts true knowledge of every created thing in relation to himself. God is the substance in which we exist. God is the truth, right? God is the essence of being, the ultimate substrate of being. So now let's have a, let's, let's go back here. Oopsie. My bad. Let's, oh, let me just go back to divine command theory. Sorry, there's something I want to bring up here. Okay, so let me redo this. Yep, so let me talk about this divine command theory again. So ah, I'll go like another five minutes because yeah, I still have a bunch of slides to complete on this talk. But so the divine command theory and occasionalism are belief systems about how things in the world happen. So let's do a simple breakdown of this philosophy, right? <clears throat> divine command theory says that what's right and wrong is all up to God. So he can decide if murder is good today. He can decide if uh, theft is good today. God can simply change his mind and say, look, it's up to him, right? So if God says something is good, then it's good because God said so. It's like when your parents set the rules at home. What your parents say goes. Occasionalism. It's like saying that nothing in the world can do anything on its own. Does that sound Muslim to you? Because that's very Islamic. Imagine remote control cars. They can't drive themselves, but they need someone with the remote. Who's got the remote? Allah. Allah's got the remote, and Allah's, okay, yeah, the first mover. Sure, sure but that's, the first mover is very much an, a Thomas Aquinas idea. The, at least the, the phrasing is very much Thomas Aquinas, and these guys are anti-Thomas Aquinas, right? So, right, in this case, God is the one holding the remote control for everything in the universe. He's, he's controlling literally everything. The rain, the wind, the, where, where the wind blows, where the leaves are going. He controls everything. So everything we do, or what happens around us, is actually God making it happen. We are just like the toys or the instruments that God uses. Your heresy meter is going through the roof, yes. So this idea has roots in ancient Greek philosophy, and it becomes more developed later on, okay? Especially around the time when people are trying to figure out how the mind and body work together. So the philosophers of ancient Stoicism had this idea that God is like an energy that runs through everything in nature making things happen. So God animates everything, right? He's the, he's the energizer that, that powers the bunny, right? This is something similar to how some people talk about evolution and survival. There's a drive in all living things to keep going and survive, which shapes how things occur, how things happen, what happens, right? So later on in the 17th century, René Descartes, a famous French thinker, added to this. So he thought that the mind and body are totally separate and they cannot talk to each other directly. See, there's a separation between mind and body. Where are we seeing this today? Trans people. Your mind has nothing. You, you are trapped in the wrong body. Your mind is trapped in the wrong body. Thanks, Rene Descartes. I thought you were a great intellectual hero that we all need to look up to and respect. Turns out you're a freaking idiot. Okay? Do you understand? These ideas have enabled the insanity that we see today. These ideas sound great on the surface. They're insane. These people were nuts. All that they were doing was trying to replace basic logic and the Christian understanding of the world. And now, now that they've done so, the kids are gay. That's not a coincidence. Thank you. I did not know the term divine command theory. Very interesting. Yeah, it, it's, I didn't know that either. So we're both learning something here. Okay. 
It's like simulation theory of today. Many people subscribe to this garbage. Polis, that's a very good point. It's like simulation theory. Exactly. If it's all simulation, then it's also very Gnostic because it's all it's all immaterial. It's all fantasy, myth-based. It's all there's it's all symbolic. You can manipulate in your head. There's nothing attached to reality. There is no anchor. Therefore, you can deny reality. Understand, it's all just reality denial syndrome. It is it is myth-making and fantasy in an insane level, right? Completely disconnected. Now, again, um, I have mentioned that um, St. Anselm. Now, what is interesting is that um, while a lot of this is relevant, if you're talking about Aristotle, you have to talk you have to talk with um, you have to talk about Thomas Aquinas, but when you listen to Pius X, right, talking about these problems, right, remember, remember, we're still focusing on the on the, the problems that Pius X was dealing with. Pius X was dealing with the same problems that Pius IX dealt with in the 1800s. This, these all go back to the 1800s. The same problems were in the church then. This was a 50, 60, 70 year battle that had been going on at that point. This, the, the Catholic Church had been dealing with this since the 1850s at least, right? 1840s, 1850s. And he was dealing with it up until 1912, right? So you're looking at a 60, 70 year gap here where this problem was had to be dealt with by the popes, right? So, but Pius X refers to St. Anselm and St. Anselm had a problem with the, with the Catholic mystics of the day. Not all of them, some of them. He had a problem with certain Catholic mystics who he said was so disconnected from reality that they were just floating in fantasy la-la land. He called them effectively heretics. He said, look, these people are lost. They're gone. They're insane. So he had a problem. And, and um, Pius X refers heavily to Anselm, not Aquinas. So he says, no, this goes back to like the 12th century, 11th century. This is an old problem. So anyway, <clears throat> so then you've got, so the mind and body are totally separate and can't talk to each other. That's why I can be in the wrong body, you know? I can be in the wrong body because I'm actually a girl in a man's body. Oh my gosh, I need to get out of here. What do I need to do? Surgery, that'll be $50,000. You see, <laughs> cheap at the price, right? Do you understand where how these ideas are connected? So, <clears throat> so then Johannes Klauber comes along and he pushes Descartes' idea further. He says, everything happening in the world, the wind blowing, the rain falling, a person thinking or moving, is actually God in action. Now, let me stress, this is Sufi mysticism. That concept there, what he said there, that is Sufi mysticism. That is Islam 101. That is Muslim through and through. Understand, this idea, this idea is Sufi mysticism. Adam, oh my golly, my gosh. <laughs> Dude, it's so nice to see you. What, I am a girl in a man's body? That <laughs> Exactly. So understand, this idea, this idea here, this enlightenment idea, where you've got these amazing enlightenment philosophers, right? Adam, fantastic. Um, yeah, great to see you, man. Thank you for stopping by the chat. Excellent. So these fantastic enlightenment thinkers, this is Islamic philosophy. That's why I said there's this infiltration of Islamic philosophy into the church. Well, into these philosophies, definitely into William of Ockham. And we see the same idea in John Calvin. So how did this stuff get into the church? How did this get into the enlightenment? This is all supposed to be rational, it's supposed to be scientific. This is Sufi mysticism. This is Muslim. How did it get in there? This is something, I know, dude, your channel has exploded. I know I've been, I've been upset because I haven't been able to watch you do anything, like demolish people in a language I can understand. But look, I mean, look, you're doing a great job. Pakistan is uh, only going to benefit from all of your uh, your fantastic work, man. So you found your calling, you found your niche, do it, you know, because people need you, right? I mean, the work that you're doing, you know, you are, you are making home runs, man. So keep doing it. Keep doing it. I mean, you are fearless, man. If anyone is fearless, it is you. So yeah, I mean, you're one of the very, very best. I mean, you're doing phenomenal work. So... <clears throat> yeah, but yeah, we have missed you in English. You need to do some more stuff in English, at least now and again, maybe once a month at least. <laughs> so is colonialism responsible for the Islamic ideology entering into Western civilization? I would say we're looking at a couple of things here. Um, that's a complex topic, Dr. Obvious. I, I have been thinking about this. I have been thinking about this. You may have noticed I discussed with, yeah, well, let's diverge quickly from the topic and let's have a look at this. Um, let me bring up this now. Let's go here to Europe. This is something I've spoken to Mal about. Um, some of you may have noticed this. Um, a couple of things. One, the Muslims invaded Spain. They took a lot of these ideas from Haran, from Turkey. 
So they took a lot of the heresy stuff, right, that they found here in Haran, right, around here in San Lirfa, here. They took a lot of these ideas from these mystery schools, these, these, these occultists. There was a huge occultist university. They took all the Sufis, took all of this occult knowledge, took it into Spain, right? That's what the Sufis did, one. Um, two, the books. Remember, they invaded a lot of the south of Europe. They invaded heavily into the south of Europe. They took a lot of the works of Aristotle, the works of Plato, and they mistook the works of Plato or Neoplatonists, people who had misinterpreted or paraphrased or added their own spin to Plato and others. They mistook these for the actual Platonic writings and the, the actual Aristotelian writings, but these were people who'd bastardized or misinterpreted or corrupted these writings, right? So they didn't have all the originals or well, they misunderstood what they had. And then, of course, these ideas went back to Europe eventually with the Crusades and other things. So the Crusaders, many of them were converted to Islam and they took these Sufi ideas, the Sufi mythology or mysticism into Europe. Then you had um, the interactions, especially with Italy. You had this, something happened in Italy in the 12, 11 to 1300, something 1400, right? Something happened in Italy between 10 and 1400. And a lot of the, a lot of the ancient texts, the Greek texts, a lot of the ancient Roman and Greek and other texts, these lost texts made their way back into Europe. And along with it came a lot of the Hermeticum, like the, the Hermetic stuff, some of the Gnostic ideas. So, and these are very similar. They have overlaps, they have differences, but they're all just both insane. So a lot of these ideas came in through multiple vectors and these ideas started to infect the, um, the European society. You could start to see European society was affected by this. And I think to a degree also, I think they deliberately created certain movements that they planted. And also the Muslims were in this part of Eastern Europe and they had heavy control and they started to fund the Protestant movement. The Protestant movement would not have survived without money and other direct support by the Muslims, by the Ottomans, right? So you had the Turks who were actively, you had the Turks here who were actively promoting Protestantism or actively funding Protestantism. Now, also, if you look at this part of Europe, as I've got marked out here, let me just move this to the side. So what you have is a lot of this area. Now, people talk about Spain, that Spain is where all of the Muslim um, encroachment was and the influence was. And that takes the attention of this part of Spain. We also know Eastern Europe, this part of Europe here, was heavily imposed upon by Islam. This area as well, okay? which includes here yeah, Avignon, which was the second papacy, right? But this area, even parts of Switzerland, lots of parts of Italy, like Le Monte Moro, that's to do with Islam, right? You've even got here this Tour des Rassens, right? The door of the Saracens, the way of the Saracens here in Switzerland. What are we doing having the door of the Muslims or the way of the Muslims here in Switzerland? There's more than a few places like that. There's some odd place names, apparently place names that start with AL, right, in Switzerland, are from Islamic influence, Islamic established, right? These are all which attest to the Islamic influence in the area, the Islamic legacy left behind. The Muslims were traveling all over this place, right? So this whole area here was very Islamic. And then a lot of heresy came out of this area here. Languedoc, this area, right? Close to Avignon, but, and then Narbonne, which Mal has been talking about. So there's something that went on here that history hasn't covered very well. And this is something I'm starting to look at. Hopefully that's, that's a, gives you some idea as to what I'm talking about here. <clears throat> Let me just catch up in the comments. So Adam says, God is good. I will be doing one stream every Monday evening now onwards in English. Fantastic. That's really good news. So guys, Adam Seeker, um, look him up on YouTube. One of the very, very best apologists out there. This man is superb. Man is good. He knows his stuff. Best I've ever seen in terms of understanding the Sira, the Quran and so on. Um, yeah, so just, just incredible, incredible exegesis. I mean, fantastic the way he owns Muslims on their stories. Um, yeah, so let me see. Welcome, Alejandro. You're late, five push-ups. Um, Pallet and Hansen, very welcome. So may God bless everyone. Thank you. Okay, so Adam says most of the work still needs to be done. Yeah, we all are doing our own part here. We're all doing our bit. Germany has a lot of Turkish people that are Muslims in the West, and I saw them with their cars waving flags. Yes, exactly. They are not loyal to the country. Spain, Portugal, and their allies, Polish and Hungarians, booted the Muslims out every time. The Orthodox failed. Now, there's a story to be told there, I'm sure. There's, there's something there that is, I'm sure there's a story behind that old Orthodox thing. There's more to that story. And just like there's more to this story in Europe than, than we are aware of. 
Okay, so let me continue. Look up Southern Spanish music. A bunch of Spanish Arabic stuff comes up. Exactly. There's a much deeper influence in that part of the world than we are aware of. <clears throat> and we need to unpack all that because historians haven't done this justice. So, yeah. So hopefully um, that's a good question, Dr. Obvious. And hopefully I've given you some insight there. Um, Dr. Jonathan Gemmel. There's a great book called How Greek Science Passed to the Arabs. Excellent. Well, look that up. Drop that in the comments later, please, so I can remember. Um, was there an unholy alliance between Zionists and Islamists to undermine Catholicism with, with Protestantism? That's, you know, I, I kind of have to say yes or no, but the, the term Zionist is used, is misused. I don't think anybody defines it correctly. I think, I think it's used as a slur, and it's used in a, in a sense that, that is designed to cause confusion, and of course, negatively, as a, as a, as a slur. Um, there seems to have been splits within within Judaism. One portion of Judaism almost certainly sort of became semi-Gnostic, semi-pagan. There were Zoroastrian influences. I've discussed this in the past. Um, when I looked into this, there seemed to be like a Zoroastrian influence. And that also seems to be the same area that Gnosticism, as we know it in the first century, originally stemmed from. Now, this is not to say all Jews. This is not to say all of the sects. A sect, right? There were also heretical sects, just as there were heretical Christian sects, there's heretical Jewish sects. And I'll say this bluntly, people hate Jews. They lie about Jews, the Talmud, Judaism, all the time. They lie flat out. Now, I'm not to say there's no problems there. It's just that it doesn't help to lie about it. Okay, Christians will lie whole day, every day, to your face about Jews because it's okay to hate Jews. It's okay to call for their death because, because we're Christians and and it's okay. Well, obviously, the Holy Spirit spoke to us, and we can lie and cause genocide because it's okay. We're Christians, right? That's the kind of hypocrisy I see. Just as you had major ruptures within Christianity and these crazy sects coming out, you had the same in Judaism. Was there collaboration? Maybe, right? We do know that the Sharia came from the Baghdad region, and of course, we also know that there were 13 at least yeshivas in that part of Babylon, right? Or, or Iraq, as we call it today. The Muslims were building their little madrasas close to these Jewish yeshivas, these schools of learning, they absorbed a lot of that. They took it, they twisted it, they they modified it, they corrupted it and created the Sharia with the framework of the Talmud. When people start saying, well, you know, Islam was created by the Jews, bullshit! Because uh, they need to have a fight with the guys who claim that Islam was made by the Catholic Church. And also bullshit. So, right, but, so they've taken these ideas, they've corrupted these ideas, they've got biblical ideas, they've got Christian ideas, they've got, you name it, they've got a whole host of things in there. But the Talmud is something that is constantly misrepresented. But was there collaboration between heretical groups? Was there some kind of misguided attempt to do ecumenical things? Yes, that almost seems certain. Right. Um, let me see. Um, what have I missed? The plague happened, entire Catholic dom dominion over libraries were burnt out. The plague, yeah. Gnostic mysticism took advantage of Europe's cultured spirit. Yeah, that's probably true. I mean, these guys were always trying to take advantage. Uh, let me see what I missed. Um, Matthew Perry. Okay, so Spain and southern France had a lot of anti-Trinitarian influences even before the Arab invasions. Yes, exactly. That southern part of France, that southern part, it was a lot happening there between the southern part of Switzerland down all the way to Spain. Yeah, there were serious problems. And uh, let me see. Off topic. But I'll be sharing your work with the Luther fan later. Fantastic, yeah. Um, saying Jews and Muslims, the enemy of my enemies, my friend alliance. No, that enemy of my... No, that idea is entirely Islamic. Um, no, the, the most of the smears against Jews, I would say, are completely false, right? I'm not saying they aren't problems, but everyone just, just has it all wrong. They've got it backwards and upside down. They just hate Jews and they're willing to just whatever. Um, Muslims have a different saying. And I lived in the Middle East for 11 years, right? I spent a lot of time in a lot of Muslim countries working against groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda and, and so on and Quds Force and whatnot. Muslims have a saying, do not let your enemy know he is your enemy, right? That's a very different saying. And a lot of what people are telling you about the Talmud, 99.87% of what they're telling you about the Talmud is flat out lies. People are lying to you, okay? Just utterly and totally lying to you about the Talmud. So, so yeah, I'm... Okay, so occultists. Now, are they occultists? Yes, there is clearly occultism within within Jewish practice, or these certain groups, right, that doesn't belong there. Yeah, that, that I would, I would say. Catholics created Islam, exactly, but I thought the Jews did it. So, which one? And then some people tell you, no, the Swiss did it, you know? 
Yeah, hold on, moving on. My ancestry, I found it Saudi Arabia. My <laughs> good grief. Did Islam create Protestantism? That's a curious question. They certainly influenced it. I would say yes, to a degree, they sowed a seed. I would say to a degree. Am I familiar with Rumi? Everyone loves Rumi's poetry. It's like, ah, oh, such amazing poetry. They don't understand Rumi. The Sufis were vicious, vile, gay, homosexual murderers. We need to forget. Oh no, we need. We should not forget, shall we say, that part of their uh, <clears throat> behaviors and beliefs. So besides being great poets, they were also hiding occultic incantations within their poetry and all sorts of other things and certain messages in their poetry. Right, there's a second layer of meaning, a hidden layer of meaning within their poetry, but they were also the first to go and murder Christians when they could, and they were happy to, uh, yeah, to to have, you know, to do the gay. So, okay. All right, so let's finish here. For Catholics, okay, Catholics see God's wisdom like the ultimate boss of the world, right? God not only makes stuff happen, but he helps us understand things in the right way in relation to him, Okay. But you have the laws of nature, so God doesn't have to control every raindrop. From the Muslim Sufi view, God does control every, every raindrop. In Kaman theory, God does control every raindrop. I hope that diversion was useful and interesting anyway. So I don't like talking offhand, off the cuff, about things that I haven't prepared. Okay, These are just things that I, because I can't defend them very well, because I don't have all the notes, I'd have to go back and do a lot of research, whereas I prefer to stick to things that I've got in front of me. So to sum up, according to these theories, when it comes to why things happen or what's right and wrong, it's because of God's will or God's command. From a leaf falling, from a tree to a person making a choice, it's actually God with the remote control controlling you like a puppet. So you have no free will. And that made its way into the ideas of people like John Calvin and also made its way into people like Martin Luther. And we have to ask ourselves, where do these ideas come from? We have to. And the parallels with Islam are very disturbing. Oh, wait, Atex says it's more like there were Gnostic influences in both sides so they on certain issues seem to move in the same direction. Yes, in the case of the Jews, not all groups, but many. Yes, so there is this influence. Look, this is infected everywhere. It's been in the Catholic Church. It's been in the Protestant Church. It's been in some of the Jewish Pharisees. So certainly it's there. It's, it's this corrupt influence that tries to get in everywhere. No one's exempt. Understand? So let me see. Um, <clears throat> let me see what I missed. If it weren't for the Catholics, we'd all be speaking... Yeah, but that is true. If it weren't for the Catholics, you'd all be praying with your butts in the air right now. I mean, honestly, quite bluntly. Okay. <laughs> yeah, John Calvin took this from Sunni Islam. Full stop. Adam Seeker, I agree with you. I agree with you. The parallels are scary. I need to work on that presentation to look at these very strong parallels, the, the philosophical parallels and the practical parallels. Yeah, there, there's something Muslim about John Calvin. It's something crazy Muslim and very Sufi about these ideas. So, okay. So, guys... I still need to work on these slides. As you can see, these are unprepared slides. This is, I mean, you can see this is kind of done. This is done. But so I should end here because these slides I still need to work on. So I had my notes done up to here, right? And I should stop here on slide 68. But it's been an hour and a quarter. And I try not to go for too long, as you know. Um, let me see the comments. The Gnostic heresy was demonic from the beginning. Read Acts. Yes, it was. Um, I need to go back to Gnosticism. I'll be doing a lot more talks on Gnosticism this year. I'll be discussing Gnosticism at length. A lot of these ideas are Gnostic. So we certainly will be talking about Gnosticism much, much more. And yes, please. Oh, yes, I forget. Please like, share, subscribe if you like this. I do appreciate all the support of the channel that I received. It's really, really great for you guys to contribute to the work that I'm doing. Go and support Adam as well. He does amazing work. He is making inroads and waves in India and Pakistan, which is amazing. The man has a gift. The man has talent. Um, far more than anyone I've seen. Uh, really, really good at what he does. Um, yeah, and of course, um, I have to say youtube -y things like, um, remember to change your oil, right? Please brush your teeth at least twice a day, mornings and evenings. Remember to floss after meals. And yes, please eat a lot of bacon. If you want to inoculate, the one vaccine you need is bacon. If you want to protect yourself from Islam, eat bacon. Twice a day, preferably. Okay, have lots of bacon, at least two slices, and that will protect you from Islam. That is very, very important. Uh, thank you very much, Paralysis by Analysis. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah remember to step into the bathroom remember to step into the bathroom with your left foot first and step out with your right foot dental hygiene is as important as mental hygiene yes um so yeah if you guys have any more important sort of youtube advice i need to be stay away from islam by eating bacon exactly <laughs> yeah 
a slice of bacon a day keeps the Islam away. Okay, these are important things, right? So stay away from Islam. Do not stay away from bacon. So yeah, so guys, I think I'll stop here. I'm busy talking. I'm going to be talking about mysticism next on page slide 68. So yeah, hopefully you've learned something because this is all these are all very relevant to the issues of modernism, how it's attacked the church, but it's not only attacked the church, it's attacked all of these sort of religions, right? It's and it's created fake religions, it's created Gnosticism and other ideas to further attack the church, right? To undermine the Bible, right? So and um yeah, it's everywhere. It's attacked the law, it's attacked science, it's attacked everything. So okay, so guys, um eat bacon. Bacon will protect you, okay? Um, <clears throat> so please, I recommend you all go buy, go, go out and buy bacon right now. So thanks, guys, um, to all of you. And Adam, thanks for stopping by. Looking forward to your talks on Mondays. So guys, Adam's going to be doing an English talk. You just say once a month on a Monday, Adam. Just remind us, was it once a month on a Monday? Or I think you said once a month on a Monday. So is it like the first, the second, the third, the last Monday? Let us know. I will advertise it and I'll be there. Um, you know, then we can all make an Adam night because it'll be great. So every week on Monday evening, so guys, every week on Monday evening, I try to stream on Monday evenings as well, but not every Monday, sometimes Monday, sometimes Tuesday, depending on my, I've got to edit these notes as you can see in front of me here. So every Monday, so guys, Adam's channel in English and the trance movement comes from Gnostic movement. Yeah, it's against Christianity. Indeed, eat more bacon. So yeah, baconism. <laughs> so yeah, guys. Okay, so that's it from me. Thank you all. And I will be back online probably, if not tomorrow, I'll decide because I need to prep some notes. Otherwise, we'll see you guys on Tuesday. And this uh, this series I'll do on maybe Tuesday. I think I'll if I'm done with this, otherwise I'll continue with my series on nominalism probably on Tuesday. Um, so guys, thanks. Have a wonderful weekend further. Adam, thanks for stopping by. And um, Dragon, Dr. Obvious, Connor, everyone else, Dan Simpson, and all the guys looking in the chat. Really, really good to have you. And um, guys, have a wonderful day from New Zealand to Canada to wherever you guys are. Um, yeah, see you soon. God bless.